igniting problem in all of the, the Arab world, even though it's not homogenous, is unemployment, is lack of jobs. Is that not the biggest threat, bigger than extremism, bigger than anything else, is lack of jobs? You need to create 100 million jobs in the next 10 years. You know, it doesn't exist. You know that's the boogeyman. That's the challenge. No. You know no? that's the boogeyman. boogeyman? Okay. Yeah. I wish I had Fadi Ghandur standing here because that's what he says. You know that's the boogeyman. <laughs> uh, that's the boogeyman people who used to whack people on their heads. Okay. If you want to create opportunities, the opportunities will be created. But you need to change the structure that's there initially to allow those opportunities to happen. You're not doing that. Oh, sorry, not you. We're not doing We're that. Not. We're not creating that. It's not necessarily a job per se. If they wanted to go in other places and get the job, I mean, for foul sake, if in a country of 1.3 billion I can find jobs, you can take the Arab world in three times as much and stuff it into India, and you, what do you call it, you, you, you have an India, right? <laughs> so I can find jobs. It's, it, but what, and the question is, what type of jobs do you want? Do you want Any menial jobs? Jo no, 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 no. Do you want menial jobs? Do you want high paying jobs? Are you ambitious? What, in the, in the peninsula, a lot you will come across are what's known in economic terms as voluntary unemployed. Okay. <laughs> this job I, I, is below I, I, me, I, I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> yes. Right? So you wanna find the job is there. But people are not willing, to, if it's below me, socially it's unacceptable for me to clean the street. Why? I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, again, if people within this part of the world would do that job, and I, we saw, I saw this happen in three countries that I can think of in the Gulf, straight away. When the moment they started becoming poorer and poorer, it started. It happened in Bahrain, it happened in Oman, and it happened in Saudi Arabia. And they started to realize, oh, guess what? I can flip a burger. Do I want the job? The thing is, a lot of them say, I don't want the job. Now, so cultural shift, is that what we're looking at? I hope. Expectation management, uh, education. I hope. You know what? In Kuwait, and I was amazed to find this out, 90-something percent, I'm not sure what it is, but it's in, certainly in the 90 percent of nationals work in government jobs. And I went, what? They have half a day. They have guaranteed salaries. When you think, look. And lots of sponsorships. How, imagine this, <laughs> right? I am sitting in my job working in a, in a multinational or working in a normal company, a local company, whatever the case may be. Uh, I work from, let's say, seven uh, to five, four, whatever the case may be. I get a low salary per se relative to those people working in those government jobs. I don't get as many day offs. Uh, I don't get these automatic bonuses. I'm not guaranteed a job. Uh, I'm not guaranteed to stay in my job. Um, I, I, my boss can shout at me. You know, all of these little things, these little nuances. And in the government, ah, oh, well, I can come in late because my friends can cover me. Uh, we can read the newspaper. I can drink my tea and don't touch, don't talk to me. I'm drinking my tea. Don't talk to me. I need my rest, my downtime. Don't bother me. Oh, and by the way, it's time to go home, bye-bye. And I'm the boss and there's nothing I can do. What the hell is that? So if you want that, this is why I'm saying it's voluntary unemployment. At least in the peninsula. That's yes. why I, 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 I cannot talk about Egypt per se, I cannot talk about the Levant per se, I don't know. Because that's where the revolutions are happening and the spillovers are going to be, will, will affect this part of the world also. Uh, we'll see. And I think we will see because a lot of things we think today are, are actually happening are not necessarily happening. But it's a perception that we have for a time until another perception is brought into our attention. The case in point, um, in the financial world you had this, I think everyone was talking about it for the last three, uh, from November, it was November, December, sorry. Yeah. Uh, October, November, December, they were talking about the financial cliff in the States, in the uh, uh, financial world. That um, if the government doesn't change something, yeah. the economy is going to go into recession. I'm thinking, 
you created this stupid concept in the first place, you can remove it. It's not that hard. The question is, do you want to? And all they were doing is posturing, saying, no, no, I'm not wrong, he is. Uh, well, if you're going to do that, then naturally things are going to go. In, the, in some parts of the Arab world where things can be resolved, can be fixed, they can. It's not out of lack of ability. Was, uh, is, is, are they allowed to move? And by the way, I think the, the one country in the Arab world that is going to probably become the successful democratic country uh, for all the necessary uh, factors, with all the necessary factors, it doesn't show at this present time, but give it a couple of years, hmm? will be Tunis. And the reason I say it's because it's the only Arab country with no oil. And that helps. <laughs> Uh, as you can see, Michelle has, uh, Michelle has been very uh, candid and frank about his opinions. Now we'll talk about Michelle as a human being, as a person, and I then am? going forward. Yes. Uh, what are your worst fears, Michelle, as a, as a person, not out there? What scares hmm. you? What worries you? Maybe when your daughter gets 12 years old, that's what worries you. I knew you were going to say something like that. Uh, I think the most frightening thing in my mind on a personal level, would be anything happening to my family. Yeah. That's the first, that's, but that's a very personal thing. And I think everyone here will share that with their, with, about their own family. Yeah. But if I was being, looking at it from a macro, the most frightening thought to me is we will end up growing as a population bigger and bigger. And there will be more greedier people. There will be more nastier people. There will be bloodier wars. There will be, and I, I forget about the wars. It's even within the normal everyday life where people start treating others as we distance ourselves. In the past, when I walked, by the way, you notice this. If, in a, uh, if an office is stretched um, um, vert uh, yeah, vert no, horizontally, people, as they pass by each other, talk to each other. You get into a lift, it could be 39 floors. 50 floors, mm. and no one will talk to each other. We end up in the small little cubicles and we don't talk to each other. And the problem is if we don't, we as humans need to communicate with each other, we just need to. Uh, it's, it's verbal communication, it's visual communication, it's hand gestures, it's all of these things. We need that. But what we're ending up doing is we're tweeting to each other on what lovely tweets we send to each other. You so and so, your mother said and that, and I'm thinking, how sweet. If you were in front of me, would you say that? But because you're hidden. You're anonymous. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. When you write what you call the things on Facebook, and things that I've seen on these social networks, I'm thinking, what the hell's wrong with these people? Think about this is a young generation that's growing up thinking this is the norm. I hope to God I'll be dead before they actually take power. Well, you actually uh, answered my next question. I was going to ask you what pisses you off the most. Obviously, maybe you've answered the question. Uh, what pisses me off the most is people, human stupidity. The stupidity, yeah. Okay, uh, that pisses enough. me off the most. Um, Michel, we, we've, we've heard about your life and, 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 and how you meandered through all of these difficulties. You seem a very passionate person, and you seem to be excited and involved and knowledgeable. What's driving you? What, what, what wakes you up in the morning? You know, you can just sit and play with your two-year-old and have fun, what drives you, seriously? Because it's what's there inside. I want, and this is from the bottom of my heart, I want to see a better world. Now, this sounds it, like it, this world, it, doesn't it? I want peace in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not trying to be, uh, I'm trying to be as genuine as possible uh, in when saying that, yes. in that I cannot control a lot of things. But what I can control, I need to control it and move it in the direction I want it to move, <laughs> where hopefully it makes li people's life better, not worse. You know, uh, a simple little thing, as I said, a thank you or a, a, a um, um, please, it's the small little words that we should be saying all the time. We never say that. We're always happy to get praise, but we're never happy to deliver praise. When, you, when, someone makes, when someone cuts you off, or someone is rude to you, or someone doesn't fulfill what you want, or you're more than happy to write to the manager, or talk to the manager, but how about the person who's actually done something nice for you? 
It's, it's those small little things. So when you ask me what drives me, it's wanting to see that change. Because it affected a seven-year-old. And it changed me. Change your life. I don't see that I'm that special. I see that everyone can have that moment of discovery, if you want, that paradigm shift in their heads. And I'd like to be able to facilitate, if possible, that thing. So when you ask me what causes me to do these things, it's because I want to see that. I mean, I think it's, it's great that that's your humility coming through. Now, if you were writing a book, what would that be about? And what would you call it? What would, the, what would be the title? Mm. Mm. Ooh, I think there'll be several books. <laughs> because one, you do read a lot, so... One, How to Survive Your Family is one. Okay, that's one. <laughs> the other one, all, all, all the things I have seen and wish I never saw. I can't tell you how many people I've come across who've lied cheated, were despicable <clears throat> in every sense, and got away with it. And I'd like to ensure that those people do not get away with it. But the problem is, if you do that, you know what the result is going to be. It, it annoys me. You know what? The, you, the biggest driver in my life, and it goes back to the way I'm saying this, goes back to the first point. I want justice. This is important. This is incredibly important for me. I want justice. So when someone does something wrong, they get punished for it. And when someone does something right, they get rewarded for it. I want that. It's something that I think is paramount to us as humans, for us as a society, a community, as, as a being. We need to have that justice happen. So when you ask me what I want to write about, this is what I want to write about. Because it hurts me inside to see when, you know when someone has worked so hard and has done everything under the sun and with a stroke of luck, and that you really need luck sometimes in your business that you do, you're successful. I am ecstatic for that person. I really want that person to win. It's because they've worked so hard at it. Versus when you come across someone for no reason whatsoever. They're given something and they benefit out of it. To this point, I'm indifferent. They got it, good luck to them. <clears throat> but when they start believing that it's their right by nature, that pisses me off. Because it's not your right. No one has a right to anything. And people talk about my rights are this, my rights. No one has a right to anything. You hope to God it happens. This is what I want. I'd like that to happen. This is what I want. If it happens, good. But it's not my right. There are no such things as these, these concepts of right. I want that to be the case, but I want to ensure that those people who've worked for what they have are recognized because it's just that they should be recognized. Small things, big things, it's secondary. The final question, let's all imagine that it's your 85th birthday today. All right. And we are all in a little capsule and we all come here together. Michelle, what would we be celebrating today about your life, the next 30, 40, 50 years of your life? What have you achieved? What have you done, not done? What would you like to be remembered by? Yes. Um, I can tell you certain members of my family would be very disappointed if I lasted that long. <laughs> On the other hand, the one thing I would like people to remember more than anything else was I was a good father and a good husband. And that's it. I don't really care about anything else. And world peace. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Michelle Kahn, let's give him a big hand. Thank you. are quite useful. Yeah, Especially I mean, as you grow older, it really helps them <laughs> Michelle, thank you. As a member of the Impolite Society that came here 45 years ago, um, I remember an incident where a professor at Elaine University was teaching and the students didn't like it and they revolted against him and Sheikh Zayed 
in those days said, I don't necessarily agree with what he said, but I agree with his right to say it. And I think we've gone backwards because quite recently, as you know, the American University had to cancel an event because a guest speaker was not allowed in because... Uh, I'm not aware of that. Uh, could you... Sorry. Recently, a, a, an American University event was cancelled because the guest speaker was not allowed in to the country. Sorry? Uh, he was a, uh, I understand he was a European doctor uh, who was talking about, um, had a, a record of talking badly about the government of Bahrain and they wouldn't let him in. And my question is, it's censorship, we've come backwards, any thoughts? One of the things that really rubs me the wrong way is censorship. I think this is the worst, one of the worst things that a person can do. And the worst is when you do self-censorship. Oh, because we've already trained ourselves not to talk about things. I honestly believe you should allow people to say what they want to no. Say what they want to say with a clear understanding that you will pay for what you say. Right? If you're going to insult me, do not expect me to smile in your face. Expect my fist to come towards your jaw. But then you still have that right to say it. And I think you should be allowed to say it, even if it bothers me. But the question is, is the problem with me or with you? And I'll leave that one hanging. Another question? I think there was a lady there. Yes, please. It's been a fascinating session so far. Thank you so much. Um, my question was, I'm new to the region, and everything that I've seen here comes with adject adjectives. So everything's biggest, tallest, best, whatever, whatever. <laughs> How do you, what is your personal yardstick to, you know, separate the fact from fiction? <laughs> Whether this is the biggest house, the smallest house, the largest picture, People want it for marketing, good for them. The, it's somebody else's problem. They want to do that, let them do it. But as far as I'm concerned, if I need those adjectives, I might have a slight little issue. I personally don't care. Assalamu alaikum, Sayyid Kanu. It was an honor to hear you today. I have attended most of the sessions, but today was really great. Thank you. It, and uh, I, I'll just put in a nutshell what you have said, uh, because I've been here from Sheikh Rashid's time. Allah I had the honor of serving him and feeding him and uh, in the hotel, not in his house. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, first of all, in the nutshell, I tell you, it was a British rule. It was two, these were crucial states at that time. And uh, in one of the companies, a British general manager was approached by the Indian Pakistani guy. He said, look, this local guy is sleeping while on duty and we are supposed to work. He said, don't wake him up. The day they wake up, we will, we will be out of a job. <laughs> so, so that puts in a nutshell what Just as you were mentioning about the family and all, believe me, uh, I'm not trying to propagate what I'm doing. I'll leave my card with you, and I hope that you are the person who can reply to an email. Sure. Because all the people I met here, no reply, nothing. They promises. Man, I don't care what you call it, who the, where the person's from, and who. It. When you send me an email, the very least I should do to respect you is to send you back. Even if it says, thank you, I'm not interested. Or refuse. Right. right? Exactly, sir. We don't do that. I'll, one example, since you have been very open, I'll be open with you. I'm doing customer services in Dubai. That's my website. I sh okay. name and shame companies, especially this hotel also, is on my website. So when you write to the DTCM, who are supposed to look after the customer service, they have their own training department. You write to the DED, they have their own training department in customer service. They do not reply to your email. Only reply comes when they are out of the station and it's an auto respond. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Yeah, my name is Tuomo Hyysalo and, and obviously coming from the impolite world. 
<laughs> and, and thank you very much for that concept. Thanks also, Tariq, excellent discussion. And I just want to ask, because when I listen to you, you could be an ordinary citizen of the internet. <laughs> so are you, are you having difficulties in controlling yourself here? And how do the people perceive you in, in this part of the world? What's the word that they were using over here? Controversial. What was the other ones? Controversial. Well, Provocative. The, the words that they want to use properly are pain in the ass. <laughs> That's what I thought. Okay. That's what they want. But people, again, because we're polite, we don't use these words. And my problem is I'm doing what we should be. See, what you're doing when you're saying, when I said you're being impolite, sorry, the part of the world being impolite, this is part and parcel of who we should be doing here. Okay? When, when the, the, the Islamic religion that starts from here starts with that same concept of being impolite, i.e. not impolite as in telling people something rude, but to say people, to tell people what I actually think. I need to tell you what I think so that I'm open with you, I'm transparent with you, I'm not lying to you. This is what, in, especially in countries like Scandinavia, we're very clear about these things. Don't waste my time. I am. Uh, this is what I accept, this is what I don't accept, this is what I want, this is what I don't want. You can live within that sphere, ahlan wa sahlan. My problem is I have that mindset. And in that mindset, I'm having a lot, I had, believe me, uh, after 22 years working with my family business, and with my family, and I don't think I'm an exception, uh, I could be a fantastic politician. Because I have had to learn how to read between the lines, how to best frame what I have to say so that people can absorb it and accept it. It's very hard for me. It is exceptionally hard for me because I don't want to do that because I feel internally that I'm lying to a, pe to a, per to a person I'm talking to. I don't want to do that, but I have to because if I am keep on rubbing them all the time, eventually they're going to hit me. Now, self-preservation teaches me I don't want to be hit. So I am hit, by the way, I'm hoping will be nothing more than emotional, maybe a bit of you know, metaphorical hitting. But uh, you might reach a point where you know, physical hit comes. <laughs> but we want, we want not to be, we, want, we don't want to be taught. By the way, case, just a small example. You pick up the phone. You're talking to somebody, business, huh? You're picking up the phone, you're calling, I have no idea, um, London, um, Stockholm, whatever you're calling. Hi, Jack, how are you? Can you get this thing done for me? No, okay, great, thank you very much. Click, there's the phone. Conversation's over, right? Our conversation. Picks up the phone. I, I'm going to say it in Arabic, but I'm sure you can get the gist of what I'm saying. Ah, Abdullah, Shonak, Shonak. Oh, sorry. Ah, Abdullah, how are you? How's the family? It's a long time I haven't seen you. How's, how, are you doing fine? How's the, how are your children? Are your children? I heard something happened to you when you called your, your brother. Is he okay? Oh, and by the way, could you get me this thing? Yeah, thank you very much. And don't forget, please, to call, please call back. And, and click. I'm like, that conversation in my world took this long, and yours took that long, but we got the same answer, right? Um, my name is Georgina Kelly, and I want to speak to something about, uh, I, I want to just ask you about emiratization, because oh, it's a that problem point. that affects all of us, whether uh, they're Emirati companies, whether they're expat companies or whatever. And um, we ourselves, my, my business, we have tried to attract young Emirati boys and girls into our business and have found it very, very difficult because we don't pay enough they work as hard, they're going to have to work long hours, and they might have to do a six-day week sometimes instead of a five. Um, so in order to be part of the solution, rather than sort of moan about the problem, I decided to go into a mentoring program working with secondary school students. And I work with um, a, a, a team of, 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 of a class of students, there are 20, 24, 16-year-olds. And what I found is that the kids are eager, willing to learn, and there isn't a problem with them at that, at that age and at that level. But one thing I think they need is I think they need young Emirati and older Emirati businessmen and women to go in and mentor them and talk to them at school level age, at secondary school, not at college, but at secondary school, about what the business world, the world of work is really and truly like. Can I tell you a little story? I had a local friend of mine, tell me a statement. 
And I, I was literally dumbfounded. I, I couldn't believe I was, this was being told to me. And his words were, you have your own family business. Why do you want to go and teach? And I'm thinking, purely from a religious aspect, because that's where I'm coming from, my prophet was a teacher. And I'm trying to follow within his footsteps to teach. My society used to pick you know, the apprenticeship kind of programs. It used to be you pick up a young boy or girl and you teach them. 